Tonight on the show, we answer that age-old question, who killed the dinosaurs? Turns out it was other dinosaurs. It's Amigos 318. <laughs> oh, Brent! <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of the Amigos, Everything Amiga Podcast. I'm your buddy, your good pal, Amigo Aaron, joined by a man that we refer to as Grade B, or Second Rate Boat. We call this guy the Brent. My B, my name doesn't start for B, just for the fun of it. I'm <laughs> rated all the way from the beginning. Yeah, that's right. And I'm, giving, I'm being very kind when I say B grade. So, you may notice that the Brent is not the boat. I know it's, it's true. Uh, the, I will say the uh, the the resemblance is uncanny. Uh, it's almost like I've just transposed onto him. It's yeah, true. it is. But all that said, the boat is on assignment this week, having some spiritual awakenings at a monkeyan retreat, and so the Brent has kindly volunteered to step in this week. The Brent couldn't have came in at a better time because, as you know, the Brent we are taking a look at the Atari classic fighting game. Primal Rage. What do you think of that? I like Primal Rage, but for all the wrong reasons. There you go. Now, let me ask you. When you were a kid, were you into the whole dinosaur thing? I know when I was a little kid, I thought dinosaurs were awesome. Nope, not my thing. Really? Well, yep. What were you into I, when you were a kid? Uh, Transformers. Oh, jeez. Transformers. I mean, yeah. as a little kid, even? Uh, As a very little child, yeah. French fries. <laughs> I got to see that that uh, that continued unabated into your adulthood. Sometimes you got to take those loves and really carry them with you. You know, when I was a little kid, I loved dinosaurs, man. But you know, I grew up watching uh, like Godzilla and King Kong movies, and so right. I would I used to think that the dinosaurs were just like one animal. For example, the Tyrannosaurus Rex. I just thought there was one Tyrannosaurus Rex, sort of like Godzilla. And he just ruled the lands. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I'm telling you, I thought this for the longest time. And finally, I got into a fight with one of the kids in, like, first grade or kindergarten. And it, and I was like, listen, let's go ask the teacher. And the teacher's like, no, no, there were tons of those. That was the biggest, most disappointing thing. Which is like, oh, <laughs> man. Now, see, I, I did something equally stupid and probably kept it with me for a lot longer than you did. I was under the impression that all the dinosaurs lived together at the same time. Yeah. Which can't be... Can't be farther from the truth. Really? Yeah, I thought they were all hanging around together, like, hey, how's it going? I was like, when I found out that it wasn't the way it was, I was like, oh, man. <laughs> I, well, listen, you schooled me. I didn't know. I just assumed they all. <laughs> you got dinosaurs, woolly mammoths, like the uh, the pterodactyls, the cyber two, saber tooth tigers, and then you got the cavemans, right? <laughs> That's the way it was. Not, not even. You're you about know? A, you're about 50 million years apart there, Aaron. You know, speaking of caveman. Did you All ever right. see that movie with Ringo Starr in it, uh, where he, where they, uh, the whole movie? I've talked to Bud about this recently. The whole movie it's about cavemen. It's got Shelley Winters in it too, and they don't speak. There's no actual speaking in the entire thing in English, except for one guy. The only guy that that speaks English is a Japanese guy. Doesn't ring a bell. They it, no. There's a scene where they create music, and they create music when these guys are beating on rocks. And one guy grabs another guy's hand and keeps sticking to fire. So he goes, wow, wow, like a James I Brown screen. I do know that scene. Yeah. I do know that scene. That's yeah. a great movie. It, nothing to do with dinosaurs. Not you, at all. <laughs> you know, uh, have you? did you get into any of the Jurassic Park films? No. I mean, nope. I, I uh, let's back up. The first one was incredible. Yeah. I, 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 I The plot was, you know, off, off the deep end. But the cinematography, the special effects... All of that was incredible. I I, I I agree with you. I had a roommate that loved that movie, and she just played it on a loop in her room all the time in her VCR. It would just rewind, play, even when she wasn't home. I could hear it in there. So I grew to hate that movie, and I've never seen it since, and I've never seen any of the sequels. I was just like, I'm done with it, man. Oh, the sequels were just just the dirt worse. Really? Are there... Are, it, can it, you, I mean, the the first one, right? You have to kind of... Sus you, well, obviously, you have to suspend your disbelief that the things that are happening are actually happening because they're so just ludicrous. Yeah. Well, you've got to just 
sever your brain stem to get through the second and the third one. It's all sort of stupid. I mean, because doesn't it effectively base they're basically turning Jur Jurassic Park into like a, a amusement park, right? That's the gimmick. Well, that's the first one, yeah. Like, who yeah. would do that? Who would no, go to that it, park? I can kind of dig that. I can dig that. They because they had ways that they thought they were kind of like suppressing their angers and like the uh one of the genders was passive more passive and they were kind of like bringing that out so they uh -huh. wouldn't go all hog wild but uh yeah. listen i'm not going to it i'm not flying to an island full of dinosaurs and just assuming everything is gonna go okay well yeah there's no way you could afford it i've seen <laughs> we well, didn't have to say it that way but you're not wrong <laughs> listen the heck with this dinosaur crap let's get to some news to brent all right news. All right, I, this is not a meager related, but I wanted to start off with it because I thought it was a really good look. You know, we as we mentioned uh, a week ago, we lost uh, Sir Clive Sinclair. Uh, he passed on, and uh, we did a little thing. We'll talk about that later, but uh, Kim Justice, who does a lot of good stuff, did a really nice little uh, look at Sir Clive. Sir Clive, a real interesting character. You can't just say, like, what a great man. He was always awesome. But what he was was a, a creative guy who knew how to gather the right people, put them in the right spots at the right time. He's a really interesting character. She did a great job looking it over. Have, what do you? I know you're not the biggest Sinclair guy, the Brent, but what? You, any thoughts on the great man? Oh, no. I mean, I I respect what he did, although he, he did a lot of stuff. Don't get me wrong. But he pushed the uh, Spectrum far farther, far greater distance than it probably would have been without him. Oh, yeah, uh, it wouldn't have existed without him. There's, that's one well, big reason. That's so, I yeah. mean, but beyond <laughs> that part of it, his marketing was incredible. Yeah. I uh, I want to uh, stress that if you are, are are bidding a fond final farewell to Sir Clive, you could do worse than catching this little ditty. Just about nine minutes. Uh, and uh, she did a, a longer look at Sir Clive a while back that I also would recommend. Now, talking about going from one extreme to the other, let's talk about our good buddy, uh, Chris Edwards. Uh, Chris Edwards has two offerings this week, and we're going to talk about this one first because this is one of my favorite types of Chris videos, the old road trip, Brent. We've done a few of these, idiotic road trips to go get stupid crap. <laughs> and, and Chris will go get stupid crap like that. He's gone. He'll like go that? get the stuff. That's it. And this time around, he goes out to get these uh, neon lights. Check these out here. If you watch the video at home, it's a Moss Technologies. Ooh. Isn't that pretty? That uh, neon awesome. light there. And he's also got the uh, the uh, old Commodore, the old chicken head. They're chicken lips, if you will. Uh, <laughs> LED. He's in the chat right now. He says here they are LED recreations. They look good. They look, look real great. nice. Uh, yeah, obviously a lot cheaper than getting actual neon. Uh, and those look pretty solid. I recommend this if you get the chance to check this out. It's The video is entitled The Coolest Commodore Lights That You Can Buy Right Now. Buy them! I think we should get some of these, uh, the Brent. Uh, these I look think good. we should customize some of our own lights. We're not smart enough, the Brent, unfortunately. Oh. Yeah, that's see, that's the difference. But we, I could like, I could hold up a light bulb, for example. But that's well, about that, the extent you know, of it. that works. Yeah, there. Yeah, so there you go. Now, listen, this is double trouble here because bam, it's another, it's another Chris Edwards. We, and I feel he like talked, we just saw this guy. I know he's back. Double trouble. Uh, he came back again for the old uh, read and write Amiga disc on your PC for forty dollars or less. Uh, hey, what a deal, right? Uh, the uh, the, uh, the gimmick is you get the old external drive, right? You get the old gimmick for the inside of it. You put it in there, and bam, you're reading and writing Amiga discs on your PC. Not a bad deal. Oh, yeah, yeah, there you go. You can think of some re reasons you would want to do that. Uh, so if you're interested in checking out either one of Chris's uh, videos, you can check him out at Chris Edwards on YouTube. It's uh, good stuff. He's always got something wacky going on, and he's also a wacky character. He was more. He added some more wackiness to our uh, meeting, which I'll get into here in a little while. Uh, I want to talk about. You know, this doesn't happen very often, the Brent, uh, but we actually had a submission over at EverythingAmiga.com. That's oh. news. That's big news, brother. And this is a, a bit from Pixels at Dawn, and it's entitled "From Cover to Career." A look at the Amiga cover disc applications. 
Oh, very uh, nice. Yeah, it's a very good article. I read through this, and uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, at the very bottom of this, he mentioned that this was an excerpt from the uh, uh, from Amiga Addict magazine. We love Amiga, Amiga Addict magazine. If you're interested in checking out Amiga Addict magazine, it's www.amiga-addict.com. I would subscribe immediately. And I'm not just saying that because they're our good buddies and our sponsors. We love them. I would check this out. Good stuff. Now, speaking of people that sponsor us, you know, I'm not normally a massive shill, Brent. Uh, uh, but the boat, you know, the boat's not here, so i got to stand up for this cat when he's gone. Meow. The boat's a hard work and do when it comes to... He does stuff behind the scenes you'll never know about. And one of the things he's been working on was a new... Amiga supporters t-shirt. You know, we don't put these many... We don't haven't done too many revisions of this over the years, which is funny because the one I've got was the first one we've got out. It had like 12 people on it. This one's got more. Uh, so if you head over... 14 uh, people. Yeah. Well, that's a... I mean, listen, that's a big deal, pal. What do you want? There's a lot of people. It's the new Amigos supporters 2021 shirt. Uh, if you're into that sort of thing, it is out now. On our t-shirt shop, uh, I've got a shorter version of the address here, if I can find out where I've put it. Uh, the uh, the shorter version of the address is AmigaTees.com. AmigaTees.com, the Brent. Would that uh, be T-E-E-S? You got that right. Uh, you got that right. And this right here is your straight-up Amigo supporter t-shirt. Uh, Boat also, if you're, if you're watching the video at home, I'm going to put myself on Supersize, the Brent. I'm going to Supersize me, if you will. He also is responsible for this t-shirt right here. If you see me play, watch this, my King Dong of Pong shirt. I love that. It's got me and you on, the, on there, the Brent. So that was pretty cool. Uh, but if, oops, ignore that. <laughs> it always happens. Uh, anyways, if you're interested in picking up one of these Amigo supporter shirts, or any number of shirts that the boat uh, has on there, uh, hop on over. You get good deals on there. And uh, a little chunk of, we get we get a few bucks. Uh, from it, we never plugged the T-shirt shop, but I figured with the new Amigo supporters T-shirts coming out, this would be a good time to give give it a whirl. Uh, last on the docket, this was kind of a slow news week. The Brent, I will say, there was a, I, I saw a lot of stuff on Indie Retro News this week about upcoming games. We don't usually cover them, uh, but I'd say within the next three months, there's going to be a lot of uh, brand new homebrew coming out for the Just Amiga. Just time for Christmas. To. That's right. You got that right. Of course, it's mostly free. Uh, let's talk about our good friend, our good buddy, Frank, RetroRewind.ca. I was looking over his website earlier, and one of the things Frank has on site, and this gets touched on occasionally, uh, but he, uh, he has some excellent uh, diagnostic tools. In fact, he sent me some diagnostic tools over to have a look and try to repair my Amiga 500. Ironically, I've pulled out the board, and I'm sending it to him to have it recapped, because <laughs> I have a feeling that that's probably not helping it with the caps looking as as poultry and poor as they look. You mean they're not supposed to be exploding and oozy? No, well, <laughs> listen. That, listen, that, that's a myth. I wouldn't say that they're oozing, Brent, but they're not in the best shape. Uh, but, listen, RetroRewind.ca is your full deal dealer. You need ROMs. You need those Amiga ROMs. Bam, he got them. You need diagnostic tools. Bam, he got them. You need a weird cable. He got those too, man. He's got everything that you need to take care of your Commodore-related products. You need your C64 or C128 recapped. He'll take care of it. You need your CD32 recapped. By God, he'll do it. He'll do it uh, for a song, brother. It's cheap. Uh, and plus, he's a good guy. And he's a big-time supporter of the community. And I'll, Absolutely. We'll say this as well. You know, we did a little thing a few months back, but you might have heard of it. It's called Amigathon, right? Frank was uh, was a very generous fellow at Amigathon. And, you know, that stuff means something to me, man. I, I like a guy who puts his money where his mouth is. Absolutely. And Frank is that kind of guy. So, uh, I implore you, especially if you're in North America, if you have any Amiga needs... Please, check him out. That's RetroRewind.ca, a fine institution to Brent, in my opinion. Absolutely. So, now, with all that said, the Brent, uh, there's one more item I want to touch on before we move on to the main event. Our good buddy, Doug, 
10 mark, if you will, uh, is running a big time art and music contest, right? Doug is after submissions right now, and time is running out uh, on this thing. Uh, it is due real soon. I'm going to check and see real quick exactly when this thing comes due. I know it's coming I up soon. I believe it's October 11th. October 11th. You can look into this right now at AmigaArtwork.com. They've got all the news you need. I watched the awards presentation last year, and it was, I'll tell you something, it was long, and it was impressive. It was very impressive. The amount of, the, the capabilities that people have to render this this uh, artwork and do these animations and do this music are astounding to me. Some of the artwork, I'm, I swear to you, this is, again, I don't want to sound shilly, but it blew me away. I just couldn't believe how good it was. Now, did you catch any of this art from last year? I do believe I, I did. I mean, it's been a while, so I can't remember specifics. Uh, but that kind of stuff, always impressive. Always, yeah. impressive. And really, it's you can go into it. If you're not, you know, mega top tier, submit something anyway. Yeah. You you have to start somewhere. You got to get your feet wet. So just cobble something together. Yeah, And, you know, someone might see it and get inspired or say, hey, I know how to help you out to get a little bit better. Get that ball rolling, and then when it happens again next year, you'll be that much more prepared. I could. I should also mention that over at AmigaArtwork.com, you can look at the galleries for the last couple of years. And I should lastly mention that this is a uh, event co-hosted by uh, everyone's favorite Pixel Vixen from straight from Japan, and she'll be helping Doug uh, pick the winners. Uh, a bona fide artist uh, in her own right, next an excellent artist and a real nice person as well. So I highly suggest. You hop over to AmigaArtwork.com. Also, check out Doug, 10-Minute uh, Amiga Retrocast on uh, YouTube. Ten Mark, if you will. He's a good guy. Doug's a real good guy, a great friend of the show. Whew. All right, Brent. With all that said, are you ready to get your rage on? Let's do it! Oh, man, that's a lot of rage, Brent. So let's talk about this week's game, the Brent. This yes. week's game is a little game we like to call Primal Rage. Now, uh, there's a there's a stigma behind this game, Brent, uh, and, and we're gonna I'm gonna try to at least shed some light on what this what's going on in this game. What was what were they thinking when they made it? And what's it all about? So, uh, before we get into the Amiga version, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the arcade version of this uh, Primal Rage, a, a game that uh, uh, pitted that Atari came out with. And it was a dinosaur-based fighting game. Okay, dinosaur-based fighting game. Now, at the time, Street Fighter was killing in the arcades and Mortal Kombat and the like. And so this is interesting to me. I, I had not read this, but a fellow at Atari named Dennis Harper said he had an idea to do a Street Fighter-style game but use dinosaurs to make it stand out. Okay? Yes. And so... He, he mentioned to another guy at Atari, named, an artist named Jason Leong, and he and he, Jason said he'd been th thinking about the same thing, and so they decided to pitch it to the people at Atari. Now, they said it was no difficult task to convince Atari to make it a fighting game, because guess what? That's what was making all the bread yes. back in the 90s. Yep. And so, the lo and was. behold, they decided it would be a cool idea. And they said, listen, he goes, we want to make our game look different, so we're going to do it in a different way than everyone else did. We're going to do it uh, with stop-motion animation, okay? Harper was a longtime fan of a guy named Ray Harryhausen. Ray Harryhausen, very famously known for all the stop-motion uh, movies uh, or the art from those movies back then, your Simbads, your Clash of the Titans. Anytime you've seen that sort of, uh, that sort of animation in a film that's made with miniatures that are moved a little bit at a time, Ray Harryhausen, if he didn't do it, he probably uh, helped, showed the people how to do it because he was the he was the master. And so the guys at Atari went and got an old movie called The Valley of Gwangi, which had uh, uh, some dinosaurs that they clipped out the dinosaur parts and they did a little sizzle reel to convince the people at Atari to make the game. Okay, so the team at Atari said, "Okay, we'll let you do it." And so. What they did was they went out and got a guy named Pete uh, Glennow. Uh, Pete was well known for his work on shows like the, like the Gumby Show. Uh, uh, he did stuff for like The Empire Strikes Back, Gremlins, Terminator, 
And so they brought him on board to make this uh, game. Each of the each of the figures in this game, all the dinosaurs in this thing, were literally carved uh, and made into action figures and baked in an oven and modeled. And each model was $50,000. So think about that. This is in the 90s, by the way. So each one of those dinosaur models cost them fifty grand just to make the model. And then they spent the rest of their time uh, going through and posing these models and adding the special effects. And that's how the actual uh, game was made. Uh, so if you think about the amount of effort and time that would go into something like that, I'm not saying that you don't spend time on like a on a you know normal arcade game where you would actually go in there and draw it, but this is an inordinate amount of time, uh, and the effect I thought was pretty uh, pretty neat uh, when it was all. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. You know, when this came in the arcade, do you remember what you thought about it? Uh, well, when it first came to the arcade, I was not impressed. Uh, I was too busy with other fighting games. And it wasn't the visuals that turned me off, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Yeah. Um, we, I, you know, I was kind of like you, but I had a buddy, the Chud. People in here have seen or heard of him. The Chud loved this game, and he was also the King Dong of this game. I would go to the arcade, and I don't think I ever saw the Chud lose. He was a, he was the death machine, the death dealer of Primal Rage. And I watched him play it for a while. And slowly, I kind of got into it just because I, there was more depth to it than I thought. And uh, after a while, I started playing it a little bit, and it was kind of neat. Uh, you really, it's uh, Atari's take on Primal Rage is different than a lot of fighting games, isn't it? Well, yes. Are, are, are we getting into gameplay? Because I've got. I've you can got talk some about the arcades gameplay. gameplay. Go ahead. Let's what, t explain okay. to people how it worked. So here's something that. Primal Rage wanted to be different, right? They wanted to be a different look. They wanted different fighters. They wanted different everything. Uh, and in their quest to be different, they took one step over the line. And ultimately, in my opinion, that's what killed Primal Rage. So you've got your different fighters, right? You've got your dinosaurs. That's different from all the humans or humanoids that other fighting games were doing. That's fine. You've got a visual stun meter, no problem. That This was one of the earlier games to do that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, you've got your punches and your kicks. It's a four-button game, but then they went and did it. They, they made your special moves, these wacky hold the button and then do your movement and then let go of the button technique. And let me tell you, it was not popular. It was not popular at all. And ultimately, in my opinion, because I think the game played well enough, it wasn't terrifically sharp. Uh, it wasn't that it suffered from a low frame rate, but it suffered from a low frame rate. Um, it also, it had good special moves. The characters were diverse enough uh, to make fights interesting. But having your special moves done in that wacky combination, which was against what all the Street Fighters and the Mortal Kombats and the Killer Instincts were doing at the time, made it confusing for players. They couldn't find special moves, and they weren't willing to invest the time and money to find them. And I think ultimately, in my opinion, that's what did the game in. Because it has some really fun aspects. In the background, you have your your followers, because the whole story plot is uh, the Earth, a meteor hit the Earth and knocked everybody back to the Stone Age. So uh, dinosaurs are starting to basically take back over. And there are still humans around, but now they worship the dinosaurs like gods. So they come, they are in the background, they're cheering for their guys. Every once in a while, they'll come forward and you can eat them. It's got different uh, mini games built into the game as secret Easter eggs that you can bat the uh, the humanoids around and whatnot. But I'll tell you, Aaron, what I, you have to have an opinion on the special move, uh, well, it, how you do the special moves in the game. You know, uh, I mentioned earlier that that Harper, the fellow that put this out, uh, uh, Dennis Har Harper, uh, wanted to differentiate it from the other fighting games like a Street Fighter by using the stop-motion animation, which I think was a good call. He also decided to differentiate this from other fighting games 
with different sorts of maneuvers on, for your buttons and joystick for your special moves. He admits in in several articles I read that this was a mistake yes. and that this was not a popular way to play the game. I think one of the reasons is the established use of the joystick and buttons for fighting games had already been made because one of the advantages of having uh, one of the advantages of having a lot of games sort of do things similarly is like you can come in from not having played it and and uh, uh, you kind of instantly know how to do some stuff. Now right. I've got an argument later. I'm not going to get into it now, but uh, uh, I'm going to. But I will admit, yes, I was not super keen on the controls on this. I also mentioned that you know. Me and Brent uh, went back when we started collecting arcade games. This was a game we bought, wasn't it, Brent? Yes. In fact, here's a picture if you're watching home. There's a picture of the PCB. This was the largest and heaviest uh, circuit board set I've ever held. And I think you'll agree with me on that, Brent. It's a beast. It's It was so huge that it had a huge metal plate that it mounted to. It was monstrous. I guarantee you could take this plate and beat someone to death with it, and it yeah. wouldn't even damage the board. Speaking yeah, then you of damage, right back up and start playing again. Yeah, speaking of damage boards, um, our board didn't have sound, as I recall. I, believe, I know yes. it had some problem, and so we never actually got it working. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so that was uh, Primal Rage, released in the arcades in 94. So let's flash forward a little bit. We'll get into more of the game's backstory later, but let's flash forward a little bit uh, to 1995 when uh, the game was released on the Amiga. Now, uh, this game came on uh, four discs, and one yes. to two players, and was developed by Probe. Probe had a pretty good go on the Amiga, the brand. Uh, we've Absolutely. Played, we've played a lot of their stuff, including Golden Axe, uh, Mortal Kombat 2, <laughs> OutRun, and OutRun Europa, which were both horrible, uh, Road Blaster, Smash TV. They did a lot of ports, T... Uh, uh, T2, TMNT, the arcade game, Tiger Road, 1943. They did a lot of stuff. Uh, the uh, the coder on this was a guy named Cameron Shepard and David Leitch and the uh, and a guy named Richard Costello. He's the only one that had done anything else, and he worked on some of the aforementioned games, plus a few others, Gone the 1 and 2. Uh, so you had guys on here uh, that were... A couple guys didn't do much on the Amiga, and one who did quite a bit. So... I will say, before we get too deeply into this, that I played this game when it came out back in the day. I had pirated copy. And this game was a real bear to load. It was it was a lot of disc swapping yes, on this every thing. every round. And also, much like the Mortal Kombat cracks, the cracks on this were tough. Uh, they, they, I had, they were wacky, you know, and so they had, they had problems. Um... When you load this up, uh, it comes up uh, just like it does on most anything else. You get your uh, probe logo, and then you get that sort of primal rage logo with the sweeping lights. That's pretty well done. The probe logo, they just sort of dithered it down, and it looks like it's bad when your company logo looks like garbage. It's like, it's, <laughs> you notice that too? Although, I don't think the game looks bad. No, I'm talking about the probe logo. Uh, yeah, I know what you're talking yeah. about. But... Um, the game comes up with a menu. Uh, that that has start game options and training, uh, and the options are pretty robust in this. You've got ten different uh, skill levels. Uh, you've got you can turn the gore on and off. You can uh, uh, set your controls to one or two buttons uh, on each joystick. Uh, you can set the number of rounds you play, the number of credits you have. So you've got you've got a, a robust option screen. Plus, it's a cheat screen that you can bring up pretty easily by just typing in a word. That gives you even more options, uh, and then once you choose your once you choose your to start game, that's when you get into the menu. Uh, what would you think of the uh, start of this game? Did you like the sound, the visuals, just as the as the game came up, the Brent? I you know I saw a lot of people complaining that the Amiga visuals were crap, and yeah. I I so don't agree. Uh, they you have to accept that the farthest level of parallax is not there versus the arcade. And some other versions. They have no but, parallax, in fact. <laughs> well, yeah, right. Uh, but the uh, the graphics themselves, yes, there's low, there's less frames of animations per fighter. That was pretty much across the board for fighting games at this time. But all the moves are there. All the fatalities are there. It has some villagers uh, or, yep. or followers that run back and forth while you're playing. 
which would have been an easy thing to leave out and, and yeah. cut down on some of those graphic requirements. It runs well enough. Would I like it to run better? Well, of course I'd like it to run better. I want it to be arcade perfect, and it's certainly not that. But it has enough going on for it that I'm happy with the graphics uh, uh, of the game. The sound... <sighs> I thought it was pretty good. I mean, it, it's, it's pretty close to the arcade. It is, but I don't like Primal Rage's sound effects anyway. Uh, it, it's a constant hooping and hollering, and I don't like that. I think it's distract. I think it's there's too much. I know what they were going for. They wanted it to feel primal with the humans, you know, cheering on your fighters. But I think it's too much, personally. Well, let's before we get um, before we get into the actual uh, my thoughts on the game. I want to talk about your characters in this. So a lot of people don't know this, and you mentioned it there. But there are two sets of of dinosaurs you can pick in this the virtuous beasts and the destructive beasts okay the virtuous beasts are like the good guys they include blizzard which is sort of like a, a giant like a uh, silver furred monkey guy a, a a guy called armadon who's a triceratops talon uh, who's a raptor and sauron uh, his was sort of like a tyrannosaurus rex actually they call him a uh, brawny ox i don't know what that is uh, then you've got the destructive beast, Chaos. He's another monkey guy. He's sort of a palette swap of the first monkey guy. Vertigo, uh, which is a uh, a sort of a cobra, a sort of a dinosaur with like snake neck. Uh, you've got Diablo, which is a tyrannosaurus that breathes fire. Okay, so you've got these guys here now. Right. Uh, by the way, I'm a I'm a Vertigo player myself. That's that's that Vertigo is my character. And by the way, each of these dinosaurs have a backstory about how they're basically gods that have taken dinosaur form through some various means. You, know, you could go into it. I mean, I could I could go into the backstory of this forever. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in here. But uh, you it's pick deep for a fighting game. It is, and they put a lot of thought into it. So much so that they even uh, put out a book later, which I'll get to that. So. Once you pick your character, you begin, and the various backdrops. Keep in mind, this is Earth from the from a, d a destroyed future, so there's still Earth remnants there. It reminds me sort of like Thundar the Barbarian, if you ever watched that show. Yeah. By the way, watch me and the boy watched the first episode this week. He dug it, so I was pleased. Uh, anyways, you're right. Let's get to, let's get to the nitty gritty here. The controls on this, I read, and I think that's why people hate this game because we listen. The sounds fine. The video on this is totally fine. You're not going to get full 3D parallax scrolling with this game. It ain't going to happen. All right? The dinosaurs are smaller than they are on any other machine. Okay? So that, that's a giveaway for the amount of, of horsepower you've got, even with AGA. But you can get look past all that stuff. People hate the controls in this game. In fact, people... I can't tell you how many places I saw reviews where they said, Listen... This game, this game doesn't have any of the special moves. How could you put this out? That's wrong. Wrong. Okay. Here's what you've got to do. All right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna clue some suckers in here. Put your joystick on two buttons. Okay. Step one. Step two. The, the, the first button. All it does is your regular moves. So if you hit that, if you hold that button and hit a direction on the joystick, you will do a bite, a tail whip, or whatever your regular moves are. Okay. That's what you have to do. You hold the button and hit the joystick in a direction, okay? The other button is for nothing but a, nothing except special moves. That's all it does, okay? A lot of people don't think it does anything, all right? Wrong. But you have to understand what you're doing. With the second mount, the second button, like, for example, if I'm playing Vertigo, if I hit towards, towards, towards with that second button down, he shoots Venom. If I hit down, 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 he teleports. That's all you have to do to get your special moves off. I contend to you, Brent, that I do. I play this better and have more fun with the controls on the Amiga version than I do the arcade version. I, and, I love that. I love and, the way they did it. And really, that that says less about the Amiga version and more about how horrible. Or it's and it's not even that the arcade had bad controls. They just weren't natural for what was going on at the time. So when it comes home and the Amiga version has a simplified version of it, it is better. Yeah. Because the arcade version was so 
backwards well, that it becomes a more fun control scheme. You have to understand, and in the arcade, they were trying something different. It's a lot like, what it reminds me of is the controls for something like a Killer Instinct. Okay? I'm not comparing these two games. But, to get into the... To play Killer Instinct effectively, coming from a Street Fighter background or a Mortal Kombat, you have to understand that the combos are the thing. And so you've got to adapt your playstyle. Primal Rage exactly the same. You have to adapt your playstyle to these different this different joystick set up with the buttons. Was it a wise choice? No. On the Amiga, on the other hand, this button this button setup actually favors the Amiga's limited controls. Uh, having one button that does nothing but your specials is genius. I went out and and found a magazine article here. Uh, from uh, it was Amiga format ep- issue ninety. Okay, they go through and they print out all the special moves for each character. Okay, and I tried all these, and they work totally fine. And by the yeah. way, each character will have five, six, seven moves and a couple of fatalities. Yeah. All the fatalities are here. All the special moves are here. Everything I remember from the arcade was here, and I never could have gotten this stuff off on the arcade. So that's one thing I think it's pivotal to understanding the, the how this game works is that second button and understanding that that just simply does nothing. But you have to if you just hit that button, nothing happens. You know, for example, I'm looking right now at Sauron. If I hold the button and hit up down, he does a move. If I hit up 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 and hold that button, he does a move. It's that simple. So yeah. what you need to do is just memorize those. And really, it's a lot easier to memorize just joystick motions than it is button motions. Uh, I, I contend that this is a better way to go. Well, and in other ports of the game, outside of the Amiga, where the controls were limited, uh, Game Boy, for example, instead of doing what they did on the Amiga, they actually reverted it back to more Street Fighter-esque controls. Right. Down to forward rolls, charge attacks, hold back two seconds, forward punch. So, <laughs> it's kind of odd. You've got all these ports. By the way, this thing was ported to everything yeah Yeah. everything got a port of this uh for better or for worse and they kind of tweaked the control scheme depending on what system it was on which really is a good move this game by the way here i read something that i'd never seen before and and i never played this in the arcade but apparently in the last revision of the arcade board they they changed the joystick settings to make it more like street fighter so apparently, there's a revision of this that we didn't have that will actually change those, uh, that will change those uh, joystick ports. But all that said, all the arcade aside, if you've got, if you're a fighting game fan and you're and you have an Amiga, uh, which we both were and both did, we know that the fighting game uh, on the Amiga there's not a ton. There's a handful of what I would call quality fighting games, and yeah. I think this one is right at the top of those games. I don't think this I think is that's fair. I don't think this is me and you both like Mortal Kombat 2 on the on the Amiga. This again, once you get past this is 2021, we're not disc swapping. So when you get past all that stuff, oh well, yeah. You know, this yeah, is Yeah, because a, the loading on this game is just I mean, if you didn't have a hard drive to put it on, forget about well, it. Uh, uh, Every round you're disc swapping. Yeah, and I will say there the the, the AJ versions did have a hard drive install. Yes, but right yes. now you don't have to worry about that anymore because you've got uh, because you've got you know, WHD load. But, I mean, I contend sure. that, that this is one of the great uh, versions of this. And I'll also say that even stuff like Eating the Villagers is still in here, which is nice. Uh, all the all the maps and stuff that pop up in the middle of the game is all there. I mean, even the, the I mean, all the stuff you would expect from the arcade. One thing about Probe is that we've played a lot of their home ports. Like, they did the Mortal Kombat, I believe, for the PC, for example. They did a yeah. good job. I know Probe gets sort of the butt of some jokes. Uh, and they have done some dud stuff on the Amiga, but I think this was a, a real triumph for them. This was a late game for the Amiga 2, 95. Yeah. So, you know, this is probably one of the last big releases for the computer. And it's I was surprised how much this got crapped on by, by, by everyone. Well, I, I think in most people's eyes, you're taking a game that a lot of people didn't like and then you're porting it, and whenever you port in something like this, you know it's it's going to be reduced in quality. There's nothing you can do about it. So you're you're starting with a game people didn't like, and then making it worse. And their gut reaction is, I'm not going to learn anything about this. I'm just going to say I hate it and move on with life, well, which is unfortunate because while this was not the best port, there are th- there are 
frames of animations missing and it, if the sprites are smaller and all that good jazz. But this is a fairly decent port which could absolutely be played and enjoyed. Yeah, and I think this they did the same thing to this that they did in that Super Street Fighter where they actually just made the characters smaller, and that's a lot better yeah. when they run at a decent clip. And yeah, this is probably one of the slower versions. But yeah, again, it's child. It, it's it's missing a lot of. If frames. you think about it, you're you're basically using for, for the most part a computer that came out in 1985 to play this game ten years later. I think it's a pretty good deal. Uh, that said, uh, the reviews for this were brutal. Uh, and I will say the reviews for this in the arcade weren't. I mean, it did well in the arcade. It made a lot of money. It did well enough to where it got all those ports. Uh, but you know, it had the stigma around it uh, that that it, you know. And also, there was all. They also got in trouble with all the parents because there's a there's one of the fatalities. Of this is a monkey pees on you and melts you, and a mother somewhere saw their kid do that, and there was a big uproar over that. So which is stupid. Yeah, there was. Now. Before we move into the reviews, I wanted to mention the Archivers just almost had a port. In fact, it, or, a, or a sequel, Primal Rage 2. Yeah. Primal Rage 2 was all but done. Uh, and Atari decided against releasing it uh, because they didn't think it would make enough money. And the the actual game is out there, and it's been adapted to where you can play it on MAME. So if you're interested in playing Primal Rage 2, you can actually do it now. It took forever. We knew about this game forever, Brent, but we didn't. Absolutely. It's a lot like the Marble Madness clone, like the, or the sequel. You just sort of waited around hoping you could get hold of it. Yeah. Have you ever played the second one? I haven't, but I've I watched the documentary about it. Yeah. Uh, and what these people had to do, because they have an arcade version of it with the board and everything, right? Yeah. Not just ROM rips. Uh, and everything they had to do to get it at least a little bit functional, it's a pretty interesting watch. Yeah. Um, despite the fact they were so invested in the backstory in this that Atari felt kind of bad for not putting out the sequel. They didn't even build it. And so they actually released a book that sort of uh, talks about what would have happened, and it. it's called Primal Rage, the Avatars. It was released in 97. <laughs> kind of, It's kind of neat. Uh, you mentioned that this got released to everything. Just for fun, as a poor comparison... I thought it was neat to take a look at uh, what was going on at the same time, and we don't do Amiga versus the 3DO too often, and so I had that set up. You can see the 3DO. Of course, the 3DO, uh, for its time, had a pretty uh, pretty solid uh, bag of power behind it, uh, but even it doesn't really have... It's got it's, it's got multi-planar scrolling, but it doesn't have the... Uh, it doesn't have the same kind of scrolling it does in the arcade, so this was even sort of beyond its abilities. And you can also see the the guys in it are just are just bigger uh, than the Amiga version and more in scale with the backgrounds. But they're not like it's not a huge, a huge, huge difference. What do you think? Well, the obvious difference is is frame rate. Uh, the 3DO is running. Uh, it looks to be a solid 30, if not more. Uh, the, while the Amiga running uh, version is running close to the 10 or 15. Yeah, and I mean for a fighting game, yeah, that it, that matters. That matters. Yeah. Uh, yeah. but if you're just gonna fire this up and and tinker around with it, the Amiga version, there's no problem with it. You yeah. can absolutely do it. I agree. Uh, I looked at some reviews on this. Uh, the brand uh, on the Amiga version, the people at Lemon, <laughs> holy smokes, they give this a four point nine five. It's in their poo poo pile, uh, on <laughs> which is horrible. Uh, this did. A little bit better in the magazines. Amiga Format gave it an 88. Uh, keep it in mind that these were reviewed in July of 96. So this is these reviews were late in the game. Um, uh, Amiga Power gave it a 77%. CU Amiga gave it an 80. Amiga Dream gave it an 86. Amiga Magazine gave it a, a 65. Amiga That's Joker closer. Amiga yeah. Joker gave it a 61. Uh, the average uh, magazine rating was 82%. I think that's uh, low, frankly. I think that's you too think low. You think 82 is low? No, I don't think... No, I think 82 is... No, I don't mean... I'm talking about the 61s and the 65. Oh, I, no, I think that's fair. Um, we had a couple uh, people from the Discord that chimed in. Alien Breeder, or as you like to call him, Alan Breeder, uh, <laughs> noted, um, I was not a big player of this in the arcade, so I'm coming in as near clean slate. But I do have to admit, I was not expecting much given the state of most lazy Amiga arcade ports. But I have to admit, I was somewhat pleasantly surprised. It was a very playable version. Graphically, it looked better than the Mega Drive and SNES versions and definitely sounded better. The characters moved quickly and were nicely animated. 
the, the characters were definitely much smaller than the arcade and on newer machines such as the 3DO and Saturn. Also of note, the parallax effects were completely absent, but once I got playing, this didn't really bother me at all. As for the gameplay, I am sure high-level beat-em-up players will scoff at, the, at this version, but I found that as an average player, a button smasher, it was pretty similar to playing on the SNES or Mega Drive versions that also tried out. Overall, this was an okay port of an okay arcade game. There's enough fun here. There's enough here to make it fun to play for a few rounds. Probably a 6.5 out of 10. So there you go. He was right in line with Amiga Joker and those guys. Yep. Pajaco chimes in. Uh, dinosaurs check. Cool music check. Good graphics ish. They didn't look a lot like the. They did. They look a lot like the Genesis version. It's a pretty good. For an Amiga, and the frame rate is pretty good. Good control scheme, sadly no. The potential, this potentially awesome game is let down by a frustrating, janky control system. The game also starts out quite hard, leaving you a little time to learn or try any moves. I appreciate that they were trying to fit in a lot of action for one button, but I could not get with it. Now you can, now that you can emulate the arcade version, I can't see myself going back to the Amiga port four out of ten. I will say this, Pajaco, this has a great. Uh, sliding scale of difficulty. You could put it on one, and, and I went, I ripped through the other guys at the lower levels. And then also, there's a training element where you can just, they don't basically fight back and you just beat the tar out of them. So I think you could. There's they gave you room to improve on this game, and uh, I, I, I actually ran through it pretty well. The Brent, I'll be honest with you, I didn't have that much trouble. Um, I looked this game up on the eBay, the Brent. And uh, believe it or not, there's a fellow in Kuwait that will sell you this for 700 US dollars or best offer. I thought that was interesting that it would be in Kuwait. I think I'll pass. Uh, if you're <laughs> if you're in Italy, 58 dollars US will take this home or best offer. Uh, in the USA, or excuse me, in the UK, you can get it for 83 dollars, and one sold recently in Germany for 23 dollars US. So, clearly, this is a game that can be picked up if you hang around long enough. Uh, or, if you don't feel like waiting, aside from playing at the arcade, as Brent mentioned, there are a million different ways to play this, including the aforementioned 3DO, the Jag. The Jag, of course, Atari put this out, so the Jag got a port. This is a Jag CD game, the Brent. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, good luck. Uh at the aforementioned Super Nintendo and Mega Drive versions, there was a DOS port of this. I never played the DOS port of this. I uh, played it. It's it's actually okay. Probe did good work on DOS, so I've got yeah. no surprise. Four there. buttons for DOS. There was a uh, as there, you would imagine. There was a 32x version of this. How did we miss that, dude? Uh, it's literally it's ported to everything. Yeah. There's a From game Super Nintendo up handheld <laughs> or console. The Game or Gear, PC. the Saturn, the PlayStation. Yeah. They all got one. So if you want to play Prime of Rage, you're set up. But please <laughs> give this a try on the Amiga with that foreknowledge that the second mouse button makes a big difference to Brent. Brent, why don't we scoot over to some site news? What do you say? Bam. So let's oh. Let's talk about what we've been up to this week, uh, the Brent. Uh, work. A lot of work. Yeah. Well, let's. <laughs> we, we all been getting into something. So, for starters, uh, if you were here last week with me and Boat Taped, uh, you will have caught uh, our little ditty, our Sinclair, Goodbye, Sir Clive, where we just talked about the passing of Sir Clive and what it meant and what it meant to a couple of dumb Americans who were late to the party on the, on the ZX Spectrum and on getting to know uh, Sir Clive. We had a lot of fun with this, the Brent, and uh, it was a good time uh, to talk about the great man. So if you're into uh, learn, just basically hearing what me and Bo had to say about him, you can check it out. Um, Brent, tell everyone about what we did last week on ARG. I went into great depth on my Paperboy knowledge. You did. I believe you played a game, too. <laughs> You don't have to say it like that. <laughs> you know, you got a lot of uh, Jack. You got a lot of uh, pats on the back for going to work on this paper boy. Uh, I, paper, I, I was very passionate about paper boy. I won't lie. I could tell. But no, the actual theme for the episode on ARG last week was games released for a system twice. So yeah. Aaron and I both found, ironically, we both found some Amstrad games and, uh, 
talked about both versions that were released and why they were two different versions released at the same time. Yeah, I good uh, fun. I looked at Double Dragon, which had a couple releases, and uh, for on mine, one there were two releases because the first one sucked. <laughs> Yeah, they were like, even we aren't that bad off. We're gonna release another one that was better. And then uh, Brent, you looked at the Paperboy, and your game basically had a, its own wacky tale. Yeah, uh, it it was released by an oopsie. Uh, publisher actually, someone wanted to distribute the game in their area, and uh, they were like, yeah, sure, here you go, and sent them the wrong disc. So they ended up publishing the wrong thing. You know. This this is the perfect example of how you can't judge a book by its cover. Uh, yeah. I will leave you uh, to go check this out on your own to understand what I'm talking about with Paperboy. But we had a, we had a lot of fun on that one, didn't we, the Brent? Absolutely. And the upcoming episode, we're going to be talking about the uh, Capcom CPS One Dash Arcade Board, or the 1.5, if you if you will. So that should be a lot of fun. So check us out, uh, the Brent. You know. Brent, you didn't play a lot of uh, Atari computer back in the day, but you did. Yeah. You played a little bit. Have you ever came across the old game, D Star Wars Death Star? Or, I'm sorry, Star Wars Re Return of the Jedi Death Star Battle. Have you ever played that one? I uh, that particular Star Wars title does not ring a bell. No. Well, by God, me and the boat did, and we played it this week on the 1200 XL show. Uh, which is dedicated to uh, 8-bit computer gaming on the Atari. This was an interesting game that had I had played originally on the uh, Atari 2600, the Brent. This was the computer version of it. And, boy, the computer version wasn't that much different from the uh, from the 2600 version, so I don't know what that means. Maybe they just kind of ham and egged <laughs> it, you know. But this is a pretty neat game. Uh, the first level has you penetrating the shield around the Death Star, and then the second level has you taking out the Death Star, which is still under construction, if you'll recall. Uh, in the movies, of course, Han and Leia, and Lu uh, Han and Leia were down on on uh, uh, the uh, forest planet of Endor, trying to take out the shield generator. And presumably, on this game, that's what the holes in the shield in the first part of the game are when you get to slip the Millennium Falcon through, driven by Lando as he takes on the Death Star. A pretty fun game. Uh, on the uh, on the uh, computer. So if you're into the Atari or into Star Wars or just into boat, looking good, looking as only he can look, then check that out on 1200XL this week, the brand. Oh, man. I just listened to this in the car yesterday. <laughs> Brent, this is right up your alley. You know, there's a man, a certain man. His name is Jack Flack. He's known throughout the land. And this week, he did a Sprite Castle on Dragon's Lair, Brent. Oh. Dragon's Lair on the C64. Now, I knew what he was getting into because this is like sort of a port or a version of the same game we played on the Coleco Atom, uh, the Dragon's Lair for the ColecoVision. And, uh, in fact, it's eerily similar looking. Uh, version of the game. It's it, This is what happens when you get a game in the arcade that there's no physical way that your machine can play, and so they sort of like... It's a, it's a loving tribute to Dragon's Lair, isn't it? <laughs> well, you know, just because when are we going to be around here again? Yeah. Aaron, did you know... You Do you remember us looking at the NES version of Dragon's Lair? Yeah. Uh, back on Thanksgiving. That's horrible. It's so hard. Did you hard. know that the reason why it's so choppy in America is they cheaped out on the carts. Really? They, yeah. It, the the U.S. carts have less uh, chips. Yeah. And the Japanese cart has it as it's properly done. Really? And it runs twice as fast. Really? Have you tried yeah. the second version? I have not. I mean, the game's not really my cup of tea when I want to sit down and play Dragon's Lair. I'll just grab the mini Dragon's Lair cabinet beside me and hit good work. Yeah. But, yeah, I saw a, a video on that this week, and I was like, that explains a lot. You know, uh, Flack also goes into a fellow who has actually taken, and I'd heard about this, but I'd not seen it. They found a way to actually play the arcade version of Dragon's Lair on the C64 uh, yes, using some kind of crazy memory tricks and all this stuff. Yep. Pretty I've heard wacky. About that. 
Uh, pretty white stuff. That's <laughs> a great picture of black. <laughs> I love that. But if you watch the video version of Sprite Castle, you get all the extra bonus footage that Flat comes up with. I uh, I didn't know that this game got ported to the C64 until I listened to this episode, so I really enjoyed it. Uh, and I think you will too. If you check out uh, the brilliant Jack Flack with Sprite Castle, uh, the video is up now, and you can also download the podcast. Great show. I will show. go check it out right now. Excellent. Well, no, wait till after the show's over, Spudhead. Listen, Brent, it all went down. Oh, did it go down? It did. And this was uh, the fourth gathering of the International Computer Club. We had our fourth meeting uh, uh, last Saturday, uh, the September 18th. And what a meeting it was. Uh, it was a slim trim, four hours and uh, 12 minutes or so of geek goodness. We had a lot of uh, fine folks uh, in, in the room, including uh, people we've mentioned earlier. We had... Uh, Pixels of Dawn. We had uh, Doug from Tenmark. We had Chris Edwards in here. We had Dave Velocirafter. We had uh, Graham W. Vepke. We had L. Curtis Boyle and Nick Marentes. We had Frank from Retro Rewind. We had Mitsuyama. We had David Z. Boat was in there for a cup of coffee. Uh, we had Edmund was in there, sort of, more or less. I mean, he was there sometimes. He was there in body. Yeah. You can see, you can see, you gotta, I, I keep telling people, like, when that show was on, it was like five in the morning for Edmonds. So it was out cold. But uh, we had a good time, and surprisingly, it was, uh, it went real well. You know, I was surprised. Also, we had Alan in here, uh, who, uh, Happy Coding, he's the fellow that did the ZX version of Asteroids. Man, he did a sort of a clinic on uh, coding ZX Spectrum graphics. This was too rich for my blood, brother. But uh, by God, he did it, uh, and it was it was something. Uh, if you are, a co I know the code heads really dug it. Uh, and I, uh, it, by the way, he was in Kazakhstan. The Brent. What do you think of that? Wow, of all places. Yeah, we had a, it was a truly international flavor this time around, uh, and I I really had a an excellent time. Uh, uh, th so I you know I, if you have if you didn't catch it. And there were other people in there. But this is just a, a kind of a quick once-over. But if you didn't catch it, please check it out. That's the International Computer Club fourth meeting. It's on the channel right there. Come and give it a look. I've got it uh, chaptered up, so you can kind of skip around if you want to. Also, we learned something about Australian rules football from Graham as well, which was, <laughs> which I think I'm one of the few people in America that liked Australian rules football. So there you go. Um, boats. You know, Boat's not here this week, Newsflash, but his Patreon song from last week's up, if you're feeling particularly brutal to yourself, because it will cause you pain, the brand, as you know. Did you did you catch his performance last week? I, I can't remember if that's the one I caught some of, and, or if it was the week before. No, it was the week before that I caught some of. I haven't uh, dived into this one yet. You know, I should mention, that before, getting back to the International Computer Club, I've noticed that you have you don't attend the International Computer Club meetings, the Brent. And well, I, and I think it's because you're working on a. The, it, oh, go ahead. Last week it was the International. I forgot about International Computer Club Day. So listen, I know what's really going on. You've got a project oh. in the works so impressive that you're going to debut it on International Computer Club number five if it ever happens. I expect a beautiful demonstration from you. Uh, perhaps it will be another graphical programming exercise on the ZX or the Amstrad. Perhaps it will be a, uh, a some kind of computer project like Chris Edwards. We never we don't know what to expect from you, Brett, but I'm sure you're going to have a real winner for us, aren't you? I think I'm just going to do all three. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Or you're going to show up there for ten minutes, <laughs> or, and then uh, wander off, which I'd say is the my uh, dingling. Yeah, I, <laughs> my <laughs> dingling. <laughs> no, no, no. So, last but not least, our good buddy, Frodo NL, the Frodster. You know, every week I talk about Frodo doing stuff I like, and, you know, I I just play with my game gear. I pulled it out of the uh, closet the other day because I've got one of these things, including the bizarre wacky pack that goes in the back that makes it weigh a 1,000 pounds. And I was playing that the other day, and I thought to myself, this thing got, uh, is, is underrated. Man, this thing's pretty good. And lo and behold, Frodo jumps up and does the first year of the Sega Game Gear, Brent. Uh, did you oh. did you ever play a Game Gear back in the day? Oh, absolutely. I knew people that owned one. Really? But you didn't have one yourself? I did not. Too yeah. cheap? 
Uh, well, I was a Game Boy guy. So. Oh, man. Well, look, he got Tetris. There it is. That's Colin. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> They're all the same, pal. <laughs> I'm looking over the. I'm looking through the list here of what he's got here, because uh, I didn't know what the first year of the uh, of the uh, uh, Game Gear had on it. Looks like you got some Shinobi. Looks like you had some Columns. Like there's some kind of generic shooting game. Uh, Donald Duck game. <laughs> sure, why not, man? Outrun. I, I bet their Outrun was pretty good. Yeah, that's better than the Amiga version. Chalk it up. There's another one. What? <laughs> Pingo. Rubbing my face on asphalt is better than the Amiga That's one. That's true. Pingo looks like Zany Golf. I recognize a lot of these titles. I don't know that one. That might have been... Uh, uh, what's that game about the, with the Fox? I can't remember. There's a Sonic game. They knew where their bread was buttered on the old Game Gear. So check it out. If you want to see something that's always entertaining, Frodo NL doing some first year of the Sega Game Gear, the Brent. Absolutely. You know... As we uh, start to wind this thing down, uh, I want to acknowledge. Oh, don't not. It's not nap time, pal. Oh, I want to acknowledge some of the fine folks that keep the ball rolling. The Brent. Now you know uh, uh, the boat has a, a lovely list here. I'm going to go over. These are the people that have contributed to us via Twitch the subscription, folks. I'm going to read your names because we appreciate you guys for helping us out. Uh, we've got. Rod CL34, still adolescent, Dryer Lint 17, Stormy 7971, Twilight Zoner. You know, I just watched a documentary on Rod Serling today. Let's focus there. Sorry, I just I love that guy. Bark Bit, Blue Train, Jigglebox, Wishbone, Buck Owens, Jason Warrens, Iori 4077. By the way, where'd you get that number? Is that a birthday or focus something? Focus there. Well, I'm just asking, so it's a mash thing. Orom, Macintosh Librarian, McChessers. Uh, Hasekin, uh, Zat Mamoon, let's go with that, Lobsterminator, Summa Sausage, or Summa, I'm getting like you, Summa Sausage, <laughs> Chris Edwards, Zoink Suck One, uh, M1N Drax, Arctic Cube, Blow Jellyfish, El Curtis Boyle, Scumboy, Pixel Smack, Duncan Styles. Uh, Daedalus 75, Knight Rider 82, Longshank 7, Gary Heather, Uber Scooter Diver, Happy Coding ZX, or ZX if you will, Vector Funk. I got the Vector Funk, brother. The Crabs MTG, Cap not, uh, Captain Chaos DK, uh, Pig Gravy, Retro Jerry, Amiga Live, back to 8 bit with Hermski. We all love Hermski. Uh, Mitsuyama, Gary Hucker. Mike A3000, R Typer, Paul Kitching, Memories of a s Something. It's cut off here. <laughs> By God, I'm going to find out what this is. Oh, Memories of a Spectrum Gamer. Okay, I know him. Rob Flack O'Hara, Frodo NL, 48K, Explorer, Great Al G, Beach Bump 7, All of Hope, Wide World of Retro, Illuminate 08, Robin Wendell, Negsaw, Zezer Zezerfall, Rushi MSX, Matt DeFort, and Optimus. Thank you, everyone, for helping me out and excuse my stupidity for trying to say <laughs> your name. And speaking Man, of getting a... stupid, we're not done yet. <laughs> you know, normally, this is where Boat would do a rousing rendition of a song, but I can't sing. So I'm just going to read <laughs> these fine Wait folks off. These are That's our Patreons. Him. Well, <laughs> you're not wrong, but still. These are our fine Patreon buddies. We're going to ramble through these things. Are you ready to go, Brent? Here we go. It's Peter Price. Herman V, uh, Vondelay Chesum, Mark Richardson, David Hearn, Chris Edwards, Ramo K, Ramo K, David Terrence, Jude Carlos, Matthew Mobius, The Phantom Magnus, Seth Yates, Alistair Fien, Christian Russell, David Z, George Rosinski, The Amiga Show, Daniel Crabtee, Super Famicom, Crazy Loomis, William Venterscar, Heavy Systems Inc., Bundy, Frag Lord, Mark Bylan, Olaf Hope, Hermsky, Jonah, a.k.a. Simulant, Alien Breeder, Dave Velociraptor, Cowbird Boy, Lane Denson, Luke Hudson, John Cook, Bomb the Bass, or Bass, depending on your point of view, Fredo and L, Solensizer, uh, Tech Mage, Jurgen, Mr. Cola, Bernhard Lucas, Jerry Dennington, Zorglub, uh, Reflection, Simon Letch, Captain Crispy, Kilobytes of Caffeine, 
Gary Heather, Free Lunch, Kate Fox, Dave Pickford, Cameron Armstrong, Andy Jones, Lobster Terminator, Tenmark. Uh, Bernard Quinn, RMC, Tim Drew, Simon Rose, Joseph Harrison, Kyle Edder, Rob Flack O'Hara, Matthew Evil Matt Laramore, Andy Craig Shonzo, Barkbit, Roland Burke, Andrew Monks, Joe the Zombie, Leif Kalan, or Leif, if you will, Alan Kebab, Chicote, Level Lord, John Marshall from Charleston, West Virginia, Matthew Perrone, Ricky DeRocher, Creepy Dead Boy, Figgy, CTZ, The Slow Norris, Stefan Sogon Mortensen, Edmund Helen, Christopher Hassel, Robbie Abbott, Chris Folds, or Chris Folds, Laurent Giroux, Graham, W, Vebke, Adam Battersby, O'Brien's Retro and Vintage, The Huck, Gary Hucker, Paul Harrington, Boss Man, Duncan Styles, Taste from the Crypt, Josh Nan, Adam Bradley, Jonas Rulo, THT, Eric Nelson from Pixel Gaiden. Kim, Tommy, Homerstadt, Daniel Bingston, The Brutal One, Brutal Barracuda, Darren Coles, Jason Warns, The Pixter, Pixels of Dawn, and Kilborn Barman. Bam! There you go, brother. That's the whole enchilada. Man, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you guys uh, for, uh, you know, supporting us. A lot of you guys have supported us for a long time. You know, we should get into this briefly, Brick, because I'm, I'm that kind of guy. Um... Uh, we uh we put out a lot of stuff on the channel as you know the brand uh and uh often i'm asked my god what in god's name are you guys doing and i just hope my hope and prayer the brand is that uh for everyone out there that supports us and supports us all this time uh i just want to make sure that everyone is getting entertainment some bang for their buck the brand and uh by god we got more stuff coming up we've got the thanks for giving marathon coming up and also, I'm going to unleash this again. I'm pulling this thing from the grave, the Brent. You know, I started talking to Boat a while back about doing Conversations from the Dark Side, which is going to be our weird late-night talk show. And it will be coming in October, just in time for Halloween, Brent. Probably a month long uh, of Friday Conversations for, from the Dark Side, where myself and the Boat, and probably you'll come around occasionally, and we're going to do some live take some calls on the air live and just chat and have a good time uh, and probably have a tip a few back uh, on Twitch. So look for more information in the next week or so when we finally get everything uh, put together for that. That should be a lot of fun to Brent uh, and uh, a good time. So there you go, Brent. There's all the Patreons and all the uh, uh, people that subscribed on Twitch. What do you think? I think that's a fine group of folks. I agree. What do you think? We got anything left? Um, you know, go Amiga. What about, <laughs> what else do we have left, the Brent? Oh, I do believe, Aaron, that we have a lovely game for uh, coming up on the next week's show. You're right. Yes. Here we go, man. Let's get this thing going. Woo! No, wrong show, Aaron. No, wrong wait, show. I got No, no, no. Save that for about a half an hour. You'll be good to go. Uh... No, this week, Aaron, Hunter has picked, or uh, Hunter has been picked by Benny Cake. Hunter. Hunter is the next game, then? Correct. Well done, Brent. You had <laughs> one you. job. <laughs> Listen, if, hey, if they... I had a glasses failure halfway through the show. If leave they, me alone. If there's a dictionary definition of ham and egger, your picture, your grinning face is going to be right beside it, pal. And you know what? It's going to be a big plate. I'm going to be going like, ah. <laughs> Good God. Thanks, everyone, for putting up with our antics. We're going to take this thing to the house. Boat, wherever you are, uh, have a good time with all them monks. Have a couple uh, glasses of wine on your boy. And Boat will be back next week. Brent, thanks for filling in, my friend. I don't feel like you're thanking me. Well, you're right. I feel like you're cursing me under your breath. I'm going to curse you with my breath as soon as we're <laughs> off the air. But we'll save that for later. Until next week, Brent. Adios. Adios.